Go ahead and turn in your Bibles if you have them. If not, we've got Bibles at the back of the pew. Feel free to take that Bible with you. Psalm 73, very interesting psalm that we're going to look at. But before we dive into Psalm 73, I want to give you some objective statistics we have for the American church. In 2014, 10 years ago, 71% of American adults identified as Christian, 71%. Now, 10 years later, in 2024, less than 60% of adults identify as a Christian. Now, this is what that means in the front window, we know that decline is happening in less than eight years. One in two people in America will identify as a Christian in less than eight years. That means in 10 years, by the year 2033, there will be more unbelievers in America than believers. But this begs the question, why? Why? are people disowning their faith and becoming unaffiliated with the church, organized religion, and denying God? Why is that? Well, we have objective data. We have the statistics. We, we've done the, the work. Pew Research has given us five major reasons people are fleeing the faith. All right? So number five, because of judgmental Christians. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, the ones that look at you and your sin, but they don't look at their own. The, the plank eye believers, judgmental Christians, that's number five. Number four, science and scripture. They cannot resolve this alleged discrepancy between what scripture says and what science says. So that's number four. Number three, racism and bigotry in the church. They see a church as an institutional organization. Number two, hypocrisy in the church. Now, these are people who pretend like everything's okay, but you know behind the scenes their life is in shambles. I mean, it, it, it's like, yeah, everything is perfect. Everything's fine. But when you close the door and go home, the family, they are just arguing. And they're not who they say they are. And number one, you ready? Number one, the problem of evil. That's the number one reason people in America are leaving the faith. God, I, I go to church and the preacher talks about how good you are. But look at my life. My life ain't good. If God is so good, why would he allow me to experience all of this stuff in my life? Why, why, why? This is not a new question. This is an ancient question that uh, the writer of, of Psalm 73 talks to us about. His name is Asaph. He lived over a thousand years ago. And Asaph, listen, he, he, he was the guy that David commissioned to write all the music. He was a Levitical priest. He wrote, he wrote all the liturgy, all the prayers, all the songs for the house of Yahweh. So Asaph talks about this tension between a good God allowing not so good circumstances. All right, so Psalm 73. We're going to discover three phases of understanding the problem of evil. Three phases. If you're taking notes, number one, here we go. We must apprehend the dynamic to the problem of evil. We have to acknowledge it. We have to apprehend it. We have to realize that it exists, and we have to deal with the tension, or the tension will deal with us. Psalm 73, verse 1 says this. Truly, God is what? God is good to Israel. 
to those who are pure in heart. So Asaph begins with a very strong theological statement as a starting point. He's saying, look, God is good to those who are pure in heart. In other words, our, our mind is reshifted when we are pure at heart. Our brain has been reframed when we are pure heart, and we can experience that God is good even when life is not good. Why? Because we are pure in heart. So he begins with a theological statement, but then he's going to continue, and he's going to talk about this struggle. If we're honest, let's just be honest. As a believer, it's okay. As a believer, you've asked the question, why do I worship this God who is allegedly good when my life is in chaos and shambles? Why do I do that? If you've asked that question, congratulations, you're human. We all ask that question. And Asaph felt the same way. Look at what he says in verse 2. But as for me, my feet had what? Almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Hey, wh wh why, why are all the liars winning the lottery? Why, why are all the cheaters bosses and making more money? Why, why are all the, the, the thieves getting rich? And I'm over here trying to live a decent life, worshiping God, and my life is in upheaval. This is the question of Asaph. And he's wondering how the prosperity could be directed toward all the wicked. God, I thought you were fair. I thought you were just. I thought you were good. Have you not, not read the headlines? And so in verse 6, Asaph, he, he seems to have had an awakening to the consequences of wickedness here, and his faith seems schizophrenic. It's okay. He's dealing with the tension, okay? He's dealing with the tension. And you've got to appreciate his honesty here. Because look at what he says in verse 6. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell from fatness, though their hearts overflow with follies. I see their prosperity, yet I see that the evil they have to do to get there. It's almost like evil gets you prosperity. What is that? And he's dealing with this tension. And, and these people, they do anything, they do everything for the almighty dollar of prosperity. You know these people? Even if it means violence, unspeakable evil. And you can see it in the way that these people speak. Look at what Asaph says in verse 8. They scoff, they speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongues stretch through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them, and they find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase their riches. Oh, he's bitter. He's bitter. God, I, I don't get it. I don't understand it. Church, deal with the tension or the tension will deal with you. I, I met a guy about five years ago, and uh, we had this young mom who was pregnant. She started coming to our church in Georgia, and she never brought anybody with her. She was always just there, so I struck up a conversation uh, you know, Lexi, what, what, you know, tell me a little about you. You know, do you have a family? Do you have a husband, have a boyfriend? I said, no, I don't, don't have a boyfriend, don't have a husband. Um, but, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deliver this 
baby in about six months. I said, well, who, who's the dad? And uh, she said, well, uh, dad's name's TJ. Um, and and please, please don't reach out to TJ. It, he hates God. Um, I said, really? I mean, I'm, intri I'm intrigued at this point. Like, uh, let's figure out who TJ is. And I said, hey, let, let's, uh, let's do something. So my very favorite coffee shop right across the street, Mocha Mo's, and uh, Dopio Macchiato, that's where I'm at. And I said, I want, I, want, I want you and TJ to go to Mocha Mo's tomorrow, 2 o'clock. And I'm just going to walk in and pretend like, hey, wow, okay, um, there you are. Um, how's it going? And then we'll, we'll strike up a conversation about TJ. So I walk in, 2 o'clock, Dopio Macchiato, and uh, they're in the back at a high-top table, and Lexi says, Pastor Chad, Pastor Chad. And so uh, uh, they call me pastor up there. I know y'all call me brother. I'm good with that, okay? Uh, pastor Chad. So I, I walk back and uh, introduce myself to TJ. Well, TJ had a necklace on with a pentagram on the necklace. And he was real quick to tell me he was a Satanist. He worshiped Satan. All right, all right. So now Baptist pastor sitting down with a Satanist. This is uh, scary, okay, real scary. Didn't know what to say, uh, really. And, and it occurred to me probably within two minutes of him telling me that, that he intentionally told me that to scare me away, all right. Um, so I, I kept talking, and he was surprised because I think that scares most people away, which I, I, I get that. So I kept talking and talking, and... Before that conversation ended, here's what I realized. That 99.9% .9 of TJ's anger at God is why God allowed certain things to happen in his life. Why would God allow me to be abused? Why would he allow me to be rejected, dejected in school? All of his reasons for hating God and being a Satanist had nothing to do with Satan, had everything to do with God. If your God is that good, then why would he allow this? Now, believe it or not, that uh, precipitated a friendship. Now, I wish I could stand before you and tell you that he loves Jesus. Here's what I can tell you. He's no longer an atheist. He's no longer a Satanist. And he believes in God. Because he never dealt with the tension. You know what I'm talking about? Could it be that the prodigal is a prodigal because they didn't deal with the tension of why the good God allowed things to happen that aren't so good? And so he started dealing with the tension. That's why we have to apprehend the dynamic to the problem of evil. And this is exactly what Asaph is doing. So that's, that's number one. We must apprehend the dynamic to the problem of evil. And number two, we must acknowledge the dilemma to the problem of evil. There's a dilemma. It's mysterious. We have to acknowledge that reality. Asaph had some questions to deal with because he's getting pretty upset. Now look at verse 13. <laughs> All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. Even if I had said I will speak thus, I would have been betrayed the generation of your children. But then I thought how to understand this. It seemed to me a wearisome task. You know what? The, the reason a lot of people disconnect with church and their faith, they're tired. It's wearisome. They don't really want to deal with the drama. They don't really want to deal with all the stuff. I, look, I've kept my heart clean and washed my hands, and, and I'm still stricken. I'm still rebuked. I'm afflicted. Here's the question that he's asking that, that we need to just be honest and ask the question. You ready? What's the use of living right if God isn't treating me right? That's the question. That's the question that deconstructs your faith, but make sure you reconstruct it in a biblical way. 
What's the use of living right if God is not treating me right? And so David's worship leader, Asaph, is on the cusp of throwing in the towel, giving up, just like TJ, but he's dealing with the tension. And he's going to give us an answer. Now, now look, here's uh, this ancient, you've heard, you've heard this name, Epicurus, ancient Greek philosopher, atheist, all right, atheist philosopher. Listen to how he dealt with the tension. And many of you deal with it in this way. Either God wants to abolish evil, and he can't, or he can, but he doesn't want to. Or he can't and doesn't want to. If he wants to, but he can't, he's impotent. If he can, but doesn't want to, he's wicked. If he's good, he would. If he could, he should. The fact that he doesn't mean he, he can't or he won't. In that case, he doesn't exist. Pretty powerful, right? Epicurus thinks he's got a mic drop moment. But here's the problem. The, the problem in philosophy is this. Epicurus, he acknowledged what? He acknowledged that evil actually exists. That's the problem. Well, Chad, why don't you, why don't you say that's the problem? Because, listen, if he believes immoral exists, he believes moral exists. If he believes the unjust exists, he believes that the just exists. If he believes bad exists, he believes good exists. And listen, that's the moral argument for the existence of God. All right? Here's the moral argument for the existence of God. Number one, premise one, if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. So in other words, if God doesn't exist, everybody's morality is subjective. What's good for you, not good for me, and what's not good for me is not good for you or not good for you or you and you, and you have your own feelings, and your feelings determine what is reality based off of subjectivity. That's premise one. Premise two, objective moral values and duties do exist. Now, here's what you'll discover. Even if you are an atheist, you believe in morality, things like murder and lying and things that are on the Ten Commandments, which is why it's okay to be in a public high school, because you believe in moral values and duties. So if objective moral values and duties exist, you're ready. Therefore, God exists. It's that simple. It's that simple. Therefore, God exists. If there is a moral law, there must be what? A moral law giver. A moral law giver. You cannot have one without the other which is why all atheistic societies fall apart every time they fall apart. So number one, we must apprehend the dynamic to the problem of evil. We must acknowledge the dilemma to the problem of evil. Number three, we must accept the defeat to the problem of evil. This is the good news. This is the great news, by the way. We must accept the defeat to the problem of evil. Verse 27 says this, For behold... Those who are far from you shall perish. Even though it, when it doesn't seem like it, you see prosperity, God sees perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. And that's the reason we believe God is good. Now, a good God... This is what we have to understand. A good God may not always prevent evil, but here's what I know, and this is what should give you encouragement this morning, church. You ready? A good and powerful God, listen, will, will always prevent evil, listen, unless he has a good reason to allow it. And so the question, the begging question this morning is, is this, what's the good reason? And when your good reason doesn't align with God's good reason, then that, that sends you out of the faith. God will always prevent evil unless he has a good reason to allow it. It's hard to explain, but God allows one evil to take place to prevent a greater evil. You say, well, Chad, well, help, help me with that. Well, I, I'll give you a very explicit answer. 
God allowed, listen, God allowed the greatest evil to ever take place in the crucifixion of his sinless son. It's unspeakable, unfathomable. It's the greatest evil in history. But the greatest evil in history created the greatest opportunity in history for the salvation of humanity. Do you see it? Unspeakable evil created unspeakable grace. Salvation. And so the, the celebration of Resurrection Sunday would have never happened without the suffering of Crucifixion Friday. And that's why we call it Good Friday, by the way, and not Tragic Friday, because we know Sunday's coming. See, we can look in the annals of history and say, I get it now, God. I understand why you allowed this to happen for my salvation. Now, I want us to read the next verses. They're not going to be on the screen, so if you don't have a Bible, pick, pick one up. Verse 17. Until I went in the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How are they destroyed in a moment, swept away by utterly terrors like a dream one awakes? O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. He realizes, church, listen, I had the wrong perspective on the situation. I had the wrong perspective, and now I got the right perspective. I was a beast towards you, verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you receive me to glory. And then he sings the best part of the song, starting in verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. See, God is both the recognizer of suffering and the rescuer of suffering. And scripture gives all kinds of examples of this. You know these. You, you learned these growing up in Sunday school. Daniel in the lion's den. Meshach, Shadrach, and, and Abednego, burning in the fire. He kept Goliath from killing David. And listen, church, he protected you even when you didn't even know it. He protected you. That's how good our God is. All because he loves you. And he desires your love for him. So what does that mean? Listen, there's no such thing as pure accident. No such thing as luck. It was the providential plan of an all good and loving God. But here's the hard truth. You ready? Just want to be honest. As a philosopher, here's the hard truth. Just because God can doesn't mean God will. Did you catch that? Just because God can doesn't mean he will. In other words, if God has kept bad things from happening some of the time, why wouldn't God keep bad things from happening all of the time? That's a good question, right? Well, I don't know. I don't. The Bible doesn't say. Not only does the Bible doesn't say, God sees no reason to explain himself. And justify his actions. It's just what God allows to happen. But here's what I do know. That God did allow evil. And that gave us an opportunity. A free agency will to respond on whether or not we love God or not. So without evil, we can't truly and freely love God. So, what should our response be? Even when we don't understand, I want you to, the, the two most powerful verses, I believe, in this text, verse 20, 26, 26, 26, you ready? My flesh and my heart may fail. Just admit it, church. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is my strength of my heart and my portion forever. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. <laughs> Please don't run. Don't run from the only good you can experience for eternity. 
when good doesn't happen? Why would you run from God? This is where good is found. And this is the good that God is offering, that your good can be experienced more than the good of your circumstances. That's a good God. When his goodness is not dependent on your circumstances. I'll tell you the truth. While God's principles and promises are the same for every believer, his plans and purposes are different. What am I saying? I'm saying that your experiences are going to be different than every other experience in this room. But you can bank on God's principles and God's promises every single time God is good. Now, in 2003, I would come up here, and I I was the youth director at the time. I wasn't good enough to be a pastor. Uh, I was just graduated Ole Miss, uh, 2005, May, left the church, went to New Orleans, and in August, we all know Hurricane Katrina hit, and I lost everything I had in my apartment. And uh, you look back at that, and you ask the question, why? In fact, when I moved back to New Orleans after the storm, countless people in the French Quarter where I worked at a hotel would ask, why? Because I told them I was a seminary student talking about God and all that. And at the time, I, I had no idea, didn't know. I mean, I could have said, New Orleans was Sodom and Gomorrah part two, but I didn't. I didn't know. I mean, I'm not going to speak on behalf of God, but, you know, I just didn't know. But now, after the fact, 2005, we're 2024, I look at my life, and here's what I do know. If not for Hurricane Katrina, I would have never met Kelly. If not for Hurricane Katrina, I wouldn't have moved to Birmingham and met people in Birmingham that would have led me to Atlanta, Georgia, if not for Katrina. If not for Katrina, Mission New Orleans may not exist, and hundreds and thousands of people would not have placed their faith in Christ, if not for Katrina. Now, that's just from a spiritual context and a practical context. Let's look from an environmental context. Hurricanes counterbalance the ocean's tendency to leach carbon monoxide from the atmosphere. Otherwise, there would be a catastrophic cooling of the planet if it weren't for these storms. Oceans would trap too much of the sun's heat and circle greenhouse gases globally. And so what we see as evil, church, What we see as evil may, in fact, be an act of divine grace, of protection, that preserves unspeakable evil from happening. Which is why Asaph says, take heart. God is my strength. He's the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And one day, I can promise you this, In eternity, we're going to look back at the annals of history and all of our circumstances. And we're going to say, thank you, God, for being a good father. Can you pray with me? With heads bowed and with eyes closed, I don't know what you're dealing with today, but you don't have the eyes to see. You don't have the ears to hear what God is doing. But what I do know is today is the day of salvation. And what I do know is that the most unspeakable, unworthy, evil act in history was the crucifixion of Jesus, the sinless Son of God. And He came to give you the greatest act of grace that anybody could ever receive. Because you can't be good enough to get to God. And so God was so good that he came on a rescue mission for you.